<laughs> okay, let's get going. Uh, my name's John Spencer, and uh, my background is I'm an architect, but really a space architect. The last 30 years I've been working on space designs, and uh, not only for real space, but also for themed entertainment projects. And I'm the founder and president of the Space Term Society, and our focus is how do we create experiences in space that attract attention of the financial community and eventually how do we have orbital cruise ships and orbital resorts and lunar ships and all that. But what's important today is that with conferences like Space Up, we're demonstrating that space is opening up to everybody to participate. Your ideas, your wisdom, your questions are all very important for us creating a vibrant growing space industry. So basically, boarding pass, get involved. And of course, we're pressing the button. There you go. But the most important point that I want to make in my talk is from my perspective, we're really in the space experience industry. This is actually pretty radical to the normal aerospace and NASA community because they're so science technology oriented. But if you really think about it, there are hundreds of millions of people around the world who actually want to have a space experience. Probably everybody's sitting here because you're here. So if we keep the experience as the center of everything we're working towards, that includes science, it includes technology, it includes the personal experience, the spiritual experience of going outward and looking backward. So this is the most important point. We are really in the experience business. Oops. All right, and the experience of turning this is a bit of a problem. Okay, now what is the space experience? Let's just go through this very quickly. Uh, I've talked to many astronauts and cosmonauts. They've all had very similar things, looking at the Earth, the zero gravity, but just the whole idea that they're moving forward, bringing humanity forward. So floating in zero gravity. Uh, actually taking a space walk, I call it space float because we're floating. Oops. And of course everyone who goes wants to take lots and lots of photographs. So that's a key part. Uh, sunrise, sunset from space is beautiful. And we have an absolutely gorgeous planet. Some of the stuff Alex was saying was really right on. That it's all about the future, it's all about the elements. It's a very interesting planet. And of course, romance in space. I've actually become one of the key uh, proponents of sex in space, I guess the Dr. Ruth of outer space. But it's an important frontier to, pi frontier to pioneer. There, there's a lot of people interested in it. Uh, Lunar Flyby, our friends at Space Adventures, has actually sold a $150 million ticket recently, one of two they need to sell in order to commission the development of a spacecraft by the Russians to do actually a lunar flyby. And they expect to do that within the next five to six years. And one of the key things I think that came from our space program to date is Earthrise. The, the first time the Apollo mission went around the moon, they saw the Earthrise was a fantastic experience for humanity because it helped us get a perspective of ourselves. It showed Earth in the context with the lunar uh, rim that Earth is a place. It's our place, our spaceship Earth. And what's really fantastic, the next time we see this is most likely going to be financed through private enterprise. All right. And of course, we're really going to develop the moon. We're going to have moon resorts, spas, all that kind of stuff. So that's the fantastic thing. As I said earlier, everyone can get involved in this. And really, when you look at the hospitality industry, the entertainment industry, those are much larger industries than the aerospace industry. And they value promotion and branding and stock valuations, which are areas that our space community isn't too familiar with. But as we get more and more into the space experience, we'll learn more about that and find vast capital and talent resources to move forward and accelerate. Oops. So, uh, this is a quote by Arthur C. Clarke talking about new ideas, which again, Space Up is all about new ideas and discussions. And I've been through this myself for many decades when coming up with a new idea and everybody thinks it's a stupid idea and then they don't want to get involved and eventually they say it's a great idea. So, now let me introduce you to the star of this little show. We'll get into a little bit later in this. The Orbital Superyacht Destiny. This is a real spaceship design. This isn't science fiction. Uh, this is all laid out on the interiors, the utilities, the service systems, the whole shebang. And it's modeled after, as you'll see later, an ocean-going superyacht. And why did I develop this? This is about 10 years ago. Uh, 
I realized that we need different economic models in order to bring people to the space industry and that cash flow is only one economic model. These yachts you see on the oceans, and now we have the first billion dollar uh, ocean yacht, they don't exist to make money. They spend a lot of money. Uh, people don't pay to go on a super on an ocean going yacht. They basically are invited as guests. And the yachts exist for pride and prestige, social standing, branding, uh, all those kind of things. So it's a different economic model. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Now, 1982 is when I really got involved and realized space tourism was going to be the key. So that's to be 30 years next year. I was just finishing architecture school at the time. So I actually cut this out with a uh, X-Acto knife, this uh, cruise ship, which is very difficult to get the mast and all that, and put it on this space picture. And that was one of those situations where in life you have these eureka moments or you, you do something where you realize your life has changed. And this certainly happened for me when I realized I really want to be a space architect and design these things and that space tourism is the key to humanity moving forward. And the rest is history, so to speak. Oops. Ah if we can get the technology to work. Uh, I, I think I can get it. Oops. Let me. Okay. Uh, just to give you a little background myself, just because some of the stuff I'm going to show you is pretty out there. I've worked with Buzz Aldrin since 1984. We've done a ton of design work. He's a great designer, mission planning, vehicle design, all those kind of things. So I come about the space-themed entertainment and the yachting design from a real space perspective. I'm not an engineer. I know enough about it to talk to the best space engineer. But once I have a concept... There's so many talented engineers around you can bring together to d discuss it that a lot of these ideas and concepts become reality-oriented very quickly. I make my money mostly through space-themed entertainment, future entertainment design, and I've actually got over $340 million built of my original concepts to date. Uh, science fiction museum, Star Trek stuff, uh, space world in Japan. So. That's a pretty good track record, and right now, even though the economy is bad, we're working on a couple of projects that are in the billion-dollar range, which are mixed-use entertainment projects, all space, Mars, future-themed. I wrote the book uh, Space Tourism in 2004, which really looked at where we came from and where we can go, and why space tourism is the heart of the space experience and how we'll move outward. And I do a ton of strategic planning. But I'm very proud of being a futurist. Meaning, looking forward, I always try to be about 20 years in the future and think about where are we going to go in 20 years? What's going to happen? And it's amazing how you can actually do this, not with direct accuracy, but being in the direction of where things are going by seeing multiple tracks where things will merge and connect and just having an instinct of where things are. And so far, I have quite a good track record with the space tourism that's happening, uh, immersive simulation experiences, green space, and uh, sports in space. That's really looking at how do we make space more green, ground facilities, fuels, when we're in space, uh, biospheres, uh, how do we really treat space better? So that kind of. uh, now, what's great about space, it happens to be one of those areas where you get these visionary futurists really looking at it. And you can go back as far as Jules Byrne, 1865, right at the end of the Civil War, imagining what going to the moon, going to space, 20,000 leagues under the sea, uh, Walt Disney was a great promoter of space visions, of going outward. And uh, uh, Gerard O'Neill uh, envisioned colonies in space, realistic approaches to thousands of people living off-world. So Jules Verne, imag basically an Imagineer, thinking about this and just amazing ideas they had. Walt Disney, if you read those quotes, uh, using television, the media, and the media and space has always been so interrelated. Uh, Walter Cronkite, who was one of our great broadcasters, was a great promoter of space, and that brought the emotion of space to the American and the world public. He and Werner von Braun, a German rocket scientist, convinced President Kennedy to make the moon speech. That really happened. It's all documented. Oops. Uh, hey. All right. Okay. Ah, okay. And 2001, Inspiring the Future. Now, take a look at this just for a second. This is about 1966, 67, when they're in pre-production for this movie. But it's amazing how entertainment and forecasting and all this can 
build an awareness and then basically an expectation of what we're supposed to do, what we're going to do. But this was an extraordinary. I was 12 years old when this came out, so I got hooked from then on. And I mentioned Gerard O'Neill, High Frontier, 19, uh, what was this, 77. This book came out imagining thousands of people living off world. Well, someday we will build large space colonies. We'll colonize the moon, colonize Mars. And that's fantastic in that humanity has a destiny, a future. And again, as Alex said, what are, where do we came from? Where are we going? And that imagination is critical to having a spirited view of the future, an inspired view. Now, here's something very interesting. This is the world's largest cruise ship. One of the things I like to do is look at Earth-based models and translate them for space. That's very helpful and also convinces the financial community uh, that we have a good direction. This has about 8,500 passengers and crew. Uh, a good part of that crew live on the ship at least six months out of the year. So this is basically a floating sea colony. And the cruise ships are, anticip they anticipate the cruise ships to get even bigger and bigger. So this is an interesting model for space colonies. Uh, airships. Airships are coming back. Floating palaces. Basically, we're going to have ocean cruising, sky cruising, orbital cruising, and lunar cruising. And it is absolutely inevitable. And we all get to have fun actually designing and making these things happen. But it's not just design. How do you create the fashions, the hairstyles? What is the medical? What is the entertainment? What is the music? What are all these things that need to be brought together to create wonderful experiences? Now, the way I look at stuff and the way the Space Terms Society looks at things is this triangle that shows that the apex real space experiences and on one side Earth-based simulation experiences and the other side media experiences. What's great about this is this is a synergistic business. Someone can go and see a movie. They can then rise up. Let me move this. So you can go to a virtual world. Then you can go to immersive simulations like a space camp or Kennedy Space Center. Uh, you can take a zero gravity flight. You can eventually, next year probably, take a suborbital flight and then a real space flight. So over a lifetime, we can migrate people from seeing a movie to eventually going into space. That means this, from a business standpoint, has legs and what's very key for investment, scalability. Now, we're, let's get into the yachts for a minute. I love yachts. If you've ever had a chance to look at some of these magazines on these super yachts, they're absolutely amazing pieces of technology and science and engineering all pulled together. Now, this is one of Paul Allen's three yachts. What's fascinating, you see the helicopter. Some of the newer yachts are so large, they have two heliports on board the ship. These exist mainly because these very high-end people come from their yacht to the other yacht or from land to the yacht, uh, and there's security issues the whole bit. But yeah, all, the, all the yachts that have the two ones always take the helicopter up from one and fly to the other end of the ship and land. It's just kind of a tradition. But what we can learn from these yachts is how do we design orbital space yachts. One of the key areas to success for space is inflatable structures. I won't get into this in any real detail, but uh, since 1979, believe it or not, I've been a proponent in helping to pioneer the idea of inflatable space architecture. Just think about it. It's a vacuum, zero gravity. If you have a sphere that's compressed and it inflates into an open sphere, in the vacuum of space, you've got a habitable volume. We've got two experimental modules in inflatable structures in orbit right now, financed, designed, and developed by a Las Vegas real estate hotel developer, uh, Robert Bigelow. So inflatable architecture is very interesting. Now, Destiny, let's talk about Destiny just for a couple minutes. She's about 300 foot long, has room for 10 passengers, six crew members, many, many robots, teleoperators on the Earth operating things. Those large sails collect solar energy, radiate, and migrate that energy to charging stations, radiate heats away. Also look really cool. At the very center, the heart of destiny, is this 60-foot wide float sphere. Just an open sphere to float for parties, for dancing, for sports, for weddings, all kinds of odds and ends. So she's a, probably the most beautiful real spaceship existing right now. And part of what we do in the Space Terms Society is this is a key research program that generates lots of questions. How do we do cook a five-star meal? How do we serve it and clean up? You know, what are all the issues to make this happen? So it's an exciting platform to generate questions. And we're going to be animating these things pretty soon. All right. Yep. Yeah. 
One of the uh, chief social areas on a uh, major super yacht is, of course, the hot tub for many reasons. And, of course, you all know that in zero gravity, water forms a sphere. So it's obvious on site, inside a destiny, every once in a while they set up what we call the float sphere, uh, the, uh, actually, the hot sphere. So you can basically have a hot tub float sphere experience. This is set up in the center of the 60-foot diameter float sphere. So the hot sphere, in this case, is set up in the center of that float sphere. Now, racing. Let's get into this just for a quick minute. Uh, of course, there's desert racing. And if we model that, we're eventually going to have what I call the Great Lunar Rover Race. And this will be financed in, by sponsors wanting to garner worldwide attention. If you think of the moon, it's the greatest billboard there is. Everybody sees it. And imagine having a race around the entire moon, sponsored. And I've actually talked to a number of media people who want to do this. And I say, well, this is maybe 20 years away, so they're disappointed. But the, they instantly get it. People outside of the space community get these entertainment uh, ideas pretty quickly. Now, uh, Let's talk about the experience age, just quickly. We've really entered a time, particularly in America, where people want to interact and experience things on an individual basis. This is a great book. If you want to read something important, it's called The Experience Economy. Great book about the direction we're taking. And these immersive themed, environment, themed environments, it doesn't really matter what the theme is. It could be Civil War reenactment, Renaissance Pleasure Fair, uh, Space Camp for adults. It's that you immerse yourself in a themed environment. You wear the clothing, you eat the food, you use the language, and you do the activities of that themed environment. And that immersion puts you into that environment, and it proves to be a much more wonderful vacation, holiday, learning experience. And that's the direction we're taking. Space happens to be an ideal theme for these immersion experiences because they're always in closed environments. Yep, exactly. And uh, citizen explorers, more and more people are getting out and exploring different parts of the world. And for wealthy pe even affluent people, after you've been on 30 or 40 vacations to exotic locations, you're running out of exotic locations to go to. So that's why we can simulate these locations on Earth that eventually translate into being locations in space. Now, one of my favorite photos is the one with the people standing around that pole. That pole is the North Pole. Twice a year, nuclear-powered Russian icebreaker goes to the North Pole costs $35,000 per person, and you get to say you've been to the North Pole. The tradition is they play music, Russian music, and they dance around the pole. At one time, this was great quest of nations to go to these places. 28,000 people a year go to Antarctica as adventure travelers. Now, simulation for space. You know, Disney built Mission Space at Epcot Center. It's a very popular attraction. Almost 20 million people a year go to space theme attractions when you count the National Space Museum and Kennedy Space Centers and other visitor centers. And that's every single year. That's more people that go to space attractions than go to both of the Universal Studios movie tour theme parks combined. All right. Ah, okay. This is one of my concepts and designs we're working on. It's a Mars-themed resort and spa, tw 220 luxury uh, suites, 1,000-foot crater. You get to go spend three, four days on Mars in a high-quality simulated environment, but great food, great service. You get to wear spacesuit costumes, go out on the Martian surface, drive around in rovers, all kinds of odds and ends. And people are looking for new things to do. This is the key shot. Another one of my projects called Mars World, which we've trademarked and will probably be built in Asia first, it's a $1.6 billion mixed-use Mars future-themed entertainment complex. We also have a site in Las Vegas where when the economy improves, we're looking at building. It's inside a 1,000-foot diameter geodesic dome, would be the largest open space on Earth, or built space. And again, you could spend two days, an hour, a week, uh, a variety of different vacation experiences. But if we build these places and people have wonderful space experiences, they are going to be more supportive of pioneering the space frontier for real. So to finish up, uh, I just love this quote, that the best way to predict the future is actually to invent it. That's why we're all here today, is we're talking about inventing a future. We are actually all 
futurist, if you think about it. We're talking about space development, years in the future. So we get to invent a vibrant, peaceful, glorious future for humanity. But again, we're in the experience business, and that's great because it's limitless, and we all get to play to create great experiences for people. <laughs> okay, so that's the last slide. I hate this thing. But uh, let's get this into a dialogue. 